In the unbounded potential of the multiverse, there exists only a handful of beings whose powers and reputation reach beyond their own plane and touch other worlds. The unfathomable Eldrazi that live in the space between time and reality and are driven by insatiable hunger to consume entire planes. Planeswalkers the likes of Nicol Bolas who long ago had the power to both create and destroy worlds on a whim dominated vast swaths of the multiverse and spread their vision across planes. But within this exclusive list of immortal and omnipotent creatures, one man solidified his position through a crucible of blood and betrayal, anguish and atrocities to become a god whose own reputation spread as a plague across the planes. A man whose obsessive pursuit of perfection would drive the creation of Phyrexia and consume Dominaria in a millennia-long struggle for survival against invasion. This man earned many titles throughout the years the father of machines, the lord of the wastes, the god of Phyrexia, the ineffable, but most knew him first as Yagmoth, the healer of Halcyon. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric and welcome to the Lorebarians YouTube channel, where we share the lore and stories behind many fantasy settings to strengthen the connection between people and their passions. Today, We'll explore the story of Yagmoth, one of MTG's most iconic villains and the main antagonist of Urza's saga, which culminates in the Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria. We'll trace his story from the early years as a Thran physician to his discovery of Phyrexia and elevation to godhood, all the way through the invasion and his lasting legacy. Yagmoth's is a tale deeply tied to that of Phyrexia, the name given to the artificial world and the creatures born from it whom Yagmoth rules. As such, there will be some overlap between the two, but the focus will remain centered on the man. Phyrexia and its modern counterpart will be discussed at length in a separate video. But before we begin, I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Their patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. Alright, time to inoculate ourselves against Phyresis and travel to the darkest corners of human motivation as we uncover the truth of Yogmoth. Let's dive in. Before we tell his tale, we must first understand the characteristics and motivations of Yagmoth, his passions, desires, and expertise. Yagmoth was born into the ancient Thran Empire of Dominaria in roughly negative 5,000 AR. From an early age, Yagmoth was driven by scientific inquiry to understand the land around him. A world based largely in magic held little room for ideas driven by the physical, the tangible, and the rational. But Yagmoth found space within the eugenicist faction of the Thran Empire. Here, he developed many traits that became central to his character, including a fascination with disease, a scientific detachment from ethics or emotion, and a passion for knowledge. Much of Yagmoth's nature and story remained shrouded in mystery. As the largest Dominarian antagonist, he wasn't even depicted in-game until the release of the Modern Horizon set, which shows the Lord of Phyrexia before he became such. Much of what we know of Yagmoth as a mortal comes to us through the Thran novel, which relays the tales of his ascension and the destruction of the ancient Thran civilization. Chief among his attributes are his genius-level intellect and his fascination with eugenics and healing. Yagmoth's natural scientific style of healing branded him in exile amongst the Thran, who viewed his experiments with contagions as heretical abominations. This mastery over death and decay deeply aligns Yagmoth to black mana, which is reflected in the mana cost of his card. Similarly, his card's abilities highlight his prowess over illness. By sacrificing a test subject, he can transfer its disease to another and gain knowledge from the transaction, and by using this knowledge he can increase the disease's spread. But Yagmoth's more than a healer. He's a leader and joiner of forces mainly through the use of manipulation or seduction. The man is frequently depicted as a domineering figure full of confidence and without fear. He has piercing eyes and a calm, steady voice that he uses to easily sway weak-minded individuals to his cause. Yagmoth's a master puppeteer who sees in everyone an adversary to defeat or foe to overcome, and he often manipulates his enemies against one another, thereby weakening each other and affording himself an opportunity to seize victory. So great is his charisma that throughout his exile, Yagmoth was able to centrally position himself within the social structure of other civilizations foment rebellion, and spark internal strife for his own benefit, which ultimately led to the formation of the Thran Alliance as a check to his power. Yagmoth also possesses the traits of a cold and calculating scientist, interested only in his experimentation and the knowledge gleaned from their results. He foresees all possible outcomes of an event and rationalizes his decisions with frank clarity, speaking in a manner that astonishes and neglects others' emotions. 
He cares little for the lives of those he heals and sees them as mere test subjects, enigmas waiting to be cracked. He euthanizes with alarming ease and often administers his own poisons within otherwise healthy subjects to gather results and further his knowledge. His last dominating feature is his obsession with perfection and progress. The idea of a perfect world and a perfect being drives him to pursue first the artificial paradise of Phyrexia and then godhood so that he may rule over all his perfected creation. This obsession for phyresis, or progressive evolution, is instilled within those under his command and has even bled into the prevailing religion of new Phyrexia. Later, his obsession focuses on the capture of Dominaria and the destruction of Urza, its planeswalker protector, which lasts several centuries. Yagmoth's defining character trait is his ambition, his ability to singularly pursue an objective and the belief in an ideal through which he pursues it the objective being absolute control, and the ideal with which to obtain it being phyresis. Phyresis is a term of Yagmoth's own creation which translates to progressive evolution. A man whose expertise lies in plagues, affliction, and organisms understands how terribly fragile mortal life is in its current state. Only through eugenics, selective breeding, genetic experimentation, and adaptation can humanity rise above its own mortality and achieve a semi-divine status. This is the bedrock of Yagmoth's vision and the heart of Phyresis. The Lord of the Wastes uses continued perfection to gain control over his subjects, over his world, and attempts to gain control over the multiverse. He uses cures and serums to raise Thydics from the damned, instill in them a sense of absolute subservience, and install them in various positions throughout society to create fanatical partisans loyal to his cause. Similarly, he secretly poisons and afflicts all that oppose him, using virulent plagues to lower their status and consign them to death or destitution, silencing their voices. This is relayed to us in the Thran, when a delegation of other nations arrives in Halcyon to denounce Yogmoth. They reveal that he used death and disease to foment rebellion, stir political upheaval, and weave a network of agents loyal to him, so that he may rule their nations. Yogmoth's obsession with power could stem from his fear of imperfection. As a genius and scientist whose profession is death, Yagmoth realizes more than anyone how vulnerable living creatures are. Only through carefully planned perfection, only through total control, can Yagmoth save himself and his people from the death that awaits imperfection. These are merely traits of the mortal Yagmoth, a being who had long ago ascended to godhood within the plane of Phyrexia. As god, Yagmoth was transformed beyond his human capabilities and commands greater power from his sanctum deep within the ninth sphere of Phyrexia. Yagmoth's able to create, destroy, and transform the artificial plane at a whim. His thoughts are Phyrexia's, his breath, Phyrexia's atmosphere, his heartbeat, Phyrexia's billowing forges. He commands absolute control over every creature found on Phyrexia, and due to the power stones known as heart stones implanted within each Phyrexian upon creation, he can speak to them directly, know their thoughts, and command them as if their bodies were his own. Because of this, nothing in Phyrexia happens that isn't Yagmoth's wish. As god, his essence is fused with the bedrock of the plane. So long as Phyrexia lives, so too does Yagmoth, which grants him near immortality. His alignment towards black mana is further deepened upon ascending to godhood, and Yagmoth commands earth-shattering power over death and decay. We see this in cards like Yagmoth's Vile Offering, and in the flavor text of Urborg Tomb of Yagmoth, in which Lord Windgrace states, Yagmoth's corpse is a wound in the universe. His foul blood seeps out, infecting the land with his final curse. And the true extent of his power is witnessed during the final stage of the Phyrexian invasion, in which Yagmoth assumes the form of a massive death cloud made of pure black mana that pours forth from Phyrexia's depths and billows out over Dominaria. It's touch enough to kill and raise the dead, to fulfill the god's bidding. Despite these impressive powers, they are only available for his disposal so long as he retains a connection to Phyrexia's core. As seen in the Thran novel, when Yagmoth leaves Phyrexia behind, he becomes mortal once more. Now that his characteristics and personality have been discussed, it's time to explore the story of Yagmoth, why he was exiled from the Thran Empire, how he came to power, and how he assumed the mantle of Lord of Phyrexia. To do that, we must take a step back in time and travel nearly 10,000 years into Dominaria's past to plumb the ruins of the ancient Thran. Yagmoth's story begins six decades before his birth when the Thran empires embroiled in a brutal civil war. The Thran, 
are a technologically and culturally advanced race of humans that rule eight city-states in a vast swath of surrounding territory, near the modern-day Teresian Islands. During this time, the city-state of Halcyon solidifies its role as capital of the empire, but within its glistening walls, a power struggle takes hold between the elite, ruling class of imperialists, and the republican commoners. Many other guilds take sides in the conflict, including the Thran healers and artificers, which are themselves divided into separate camps. Those that view magic and artifice as the cause and remedy for all ailments, and those who view creatures as organisms, and that the cause of disease is natural breakdown of organ systems from microbes, pathogens, or viruses. The latter are referred to as eugenicists, and they side with the republicans, who share their progressive nature. Yagmoth is born during the Civil War and quickly learns the dangers that surround conflict, as well as the security and control power affords. The young man's fascinated by death and the nature of organisms, all things readily at hand in the midst of a sundered nation. He soon joins the eugenicists, although his motivations remain up to speculation. Perhaps the knowledge he gains enlightens Yagmoth to the plight of mortality, that humans are weak creatures in need of evolution. Or perhaps, he realizes that tangible scientific facts, not magic and mysticism, give meaning and understanding to the world. Regardless, he and the eugenics movement support the Thran Republican army. The civil war is bloody and protracted, but it ends as Yagmoth matures into his thirties. The result sees Halcyon and the Greater Empire controlled by the imperialists. At the artificer's behest, all eugenicists are exiled and their vile scientific practices considered blasphemy. Rebuffed by his native land and cast out beyond civilization, Yogmoth wanders through the wildlands as an exile, but this is only the beginning of his journey. In the years of his banishment, Yogmoth rarely remains idle. He continues to practice his outlawed eugenics and hone his knowledge and disease. For this, he requires a steady supply of capital and test subjects. To this end, Yogmoth infiltrates several non-human nations and plants himself within their social structure through cunning, persuasion, and subterfuge then siphons their funds and people like a terrible parasite. He acts the part of messianic healer to gain power, then use it to perform terrible atrocities in the name of progress and ambition. He genetically engineers plagues and sets disease upon the nations he visits to create upheaval, a scene with the black cough that decimates the dwarves of Orin Deep and the creeping mold that eats away at the elves of Argoth. Perhaps he performs these in pursuit of knowledge, or perhaps to prove to himself that eugenics movement is superior that he never should have been exiled. Regardless of his motives, Yagmoth's dark exile is revoked eight years later when Rebek, architect of Halcyon and wife to Glacian, the genius behind Powerstone Innovation, recalls the eugenicist to save her husband. With the knowledge gained from his travels, Yagmoth returns to the land that forsook him to find that its greatest artificer is suffering from a wound magic cannot heal. Though Halcyon is a site of majesty, it sits atop endless caverns and dark tunnels which hold the refuse of society. Here, individuals suffering from thysis, a pneumonia-like disease, are thrown into the caves of the damned to languish until death takes them. Glacian was stabbed by a power stone shard during a Thydic rebellion by its leader, a man called Gix. Magic fails to mend his wounds and no remedies known by the healers reverse his progressive deterioration. Yogmoth and his eugenic science are the last hope of Rebek, desperate to save her husband. He's entrusted with the task of healing the genius of Halcyon. Through his seemingly unnatural and inhumane experiments on both Glacian and the captured Gix, Yogmoth discovers that the cause of Thysis comes from Powerstone radiation. Powerstones are crystals supercharged by Thran mana rigs to store unlimited potential energy and are used by the Thran to power all aspects of society, from mundane sedan chairs to floating fortresses. But they emit trace amounts of mana radiation, which destroys tissue, compromises immune systems, and leads to degenerative thysis. Yogmoth at once sees an opportunity to snatch power and cement himself as an important player in Halcyon's court. As he devises a treatment to the disease, the healer instigates Gix to lead another untouchable uprising from the Caves of the Damned. Thydex and society's pariahs emerge from the city's sewers and immediately turn violent. The rebels destroy several city blocks and kill dozens of citizens, all while proving the untrained and outdated Halcyte Guard is too weak to protect Halcyon. In a deft display of power consolidation, Yagmoth ends the rebellion by devising a serum drawn from precious metals that not only inoculates the healthy against thysis, 
but cures those already afflicted. In a stroke, he's exalted as the savior of Halcyon by its citizens and the benevolent healer by the untouchables. Ambition and manipulation vault Yogmoth from detested exile to beloved hero in little over a year. Over the next years, Yogmoth becomes chief health inspector of Halcyon, using Thysis and his serum to further accrue personal clout. He first trains an outfit of loyal healer priests to administer serum and test for affliction, then reworks the Halcyte Guard to transform them into a powerful military force. Next, he purges the Halcyon citizenry and elite of those who oppose him by claiming they're consumed by the disease and casting them into the caves of the damned, regardless of their condition. Yogmoth fills the vacancy he created by administering the cure to the untouchables within the caves that he singled out for their fanatic devotion and elevates them into Halcyon society. Through this process, he silences his strongest opponents and transforms Halcyon into a city of loyal supporters. Yogmoth's manipulation of the serum leads to a second untouchable insurrection, led again by Gix. This time, however, the Halcyte Guard has new teeth thanks to Yogmoth's investment in the military. The rebellion is defeated and in actuality instigated by Yogmoth, who uses the events to consolidate even more power, taking on sole leadership of the armed guard in the event of a crisis. Yogmoth's ruthless cunning tightens his grip over an already suffocated Halcyon. It's also at this time Yogmoth makes a chance encounter that dramatically alters his fate when he happens upon the Planeswalker Dyfed in a conversation with Glacian. The Thran physician hears Dyfed mention of worlds beyond Dominaria, of a multiverse of infinite possibility that exists within the blind eternities, and his mind's instantly opened to opportunity. Throughout his life, Yogmoth has pursued personal power and used his ambition to gain control over his world. For years, he's thought only of mortalities and Dominaria's imperfections and sought a way to progressively mold them. Now that he hears countless worlds exist beyond his imagination, Yogmoth wishes to see them and find one of absolute perfection where he can rule under absolute authority. He interrupts their conversation and demands a display of Dyfed's talents as a walker. Against Glacian's strong oppositions, Dyfed offers to indulge Yogmoth and prove her existence as a planeswalker. She transports him across the blind eternities and walks to several other worlds, showing Yogmoth the existence of the multiverse and demonstrating her own skills. The healer is mesmerized by what he sees and ecstatic about the infinite possibilities of the multiverse. He envisions a paradise, a perfect world where he may rule a people beyond disease, beyond want and death. He seeks to elevate himself to godhood and lead a race of perfected beings. To this end, he implores Dyfed to find a world fitting of Yogmoth's vision. Within months, she locates one and brings Yogmoth to it. Rolling hills, meandering waters, waving plains, and endless sunlight coat the landscape of a beautiful paradise. Dyfed reveals that this world isn't like others. Rather than a naturally born plane, this location has been artificially created by another planeswalker. She states that although everything on the surface is tangible, edible, and perhaps even alive, it has been formed from the mind of the plane's master, and the surface is just one of many spheres nested within another that create the plane. Dyfed takes Yogmoth on a tour of the other spheres, showing him the metal cables and struts that support the world above, the seas of glistening oil from which the organisms that populate the plane are born, and the massive furnaces that act as the plane's heating source. Finally, Dyfed takes Yogmoth to the heart of the plane within the ninth sphere. It's a dark and especially cramped space, barely large enough for Yogmoth to pace upright. The decomposing corpse of the planeswalker that created this artificial realm sits within the ninth sphere, a mysterious being whom Dyfed states loved to assume the form of a dragon and had only just passed a short time ago. She also informs Yogmoth that without the planeswalker to continually power and protect the plane, it will slowly collapse until it's crushed under the weight of the blind eternities. Yogmoth refuses to consign the plane to its death after having witnessed its beautiful perfection. He demands Dyfed perform a ritual to confer onto him the powers necessary to maintain the artificial realm. Yogmoth vivisects the dead planeswalker to not only glean some of its memories and abilities, but to seek out the organ of a planeswalker, a spark. When Dyfed returns to perform the ritual, Yogmoth reveals that through his consumption of the old master, the plane has already begun to bond with him. Through the use of dark and ancient sorceries, Dyfed enacts the ritual. Yogmoth seethes with power and omnipotence. His consciousness merges with that of the plane, 
its will becomes his own. With the spell complete, Yogmoth becomes the god over his new paradise, a plane where the process of phyresis, or progressive evolution, can unfold in dazzling displays, a plane he names Phyrexia. Dyfed's ritual also creates a permanent gate between Phyrexia and the Caves of the Damned, from which Yogmoth brings countless afflicted houseites over to the healing lands and oils of Phyrexia. These people soon become his first experiments in Phyresis. A slow process unfolds in which afflicted Thran are brought to Phyrexia, implanted with heart stones, which heals them and allows the Lord of Phyrexia to enter their minds, and then they're transformed beyond recognition. Yogmoth's own health core becomes warped as they tend to the healing vats of oil. These experimenters and healers become vat priests, and a religious fanaticism takes hold over all who enter Phyrexia, with Yogmoth at its center. But all doesn't go smoothly for the savior of Halcyon. The city is visited by a united delegation of non-human empires beyond the Thran's borders. This group of dwarves, minotaurs, elves, and catfolk throw terrible accusations at Yagmoth's feet and lay bare the atrocities he committed during his Thran exile. They warn the Thran that he is the vile disease, not Physis, that he poisons and corrupts all he touches to make himself invaluable and promote his own agenda. The delegation tells of the engineered plagues he let loose on their people and of the rebellions he instigated. Yagmoth is a vile force not to be trusted. The Halcyon Elder Council moves for a vote on whether to exile or retain Yagmoth after listening to the delegation. With each count, it seems the chambers evenly split between the two options. But as chief health inspector, Yagmoth himself has a vote. Though he retains his power in Halcyon, the revelation of Yagmoth's brutal past creates a rift between the Thran city-states. Several secede from the Empire to join the non-human nations. This Thran alliance delivers an ultimatum to the Halcytes and those Thran loyal to Yagmoth. Relinquish this authoritarian pretender or prepare for war. Yagmoth ingrained himself so much within Halcyon that the only elders who remain are either too afraid to stand against him or wholly devoted to his cause and blinded by his illusion. The ultimatum passes without response, and Yagmoth prepares not only Halcyon, but his beautiful Phyrexia for battle. Soon after, the Thran-Phyrexian War begins, which will mark the end of the illustrious and advanced Thran Empire. As war erupts across the Empire, Yagmoth uses Glacian's own fraying mind to create some of the most impressive artificial weapons and defense systems for his Halcyte and Phyrexian fighting forces. Though the Thran Alliance captures several city-states, Yagmoth deals a terrible blow in the first phase of the war, when he takes to the skies with his newly outfitted armada of caravels and skyships. Their ray cannon technology rips apart the terribly outdated fleet of the Thran Alliance in a bloody aerial conflict. The Alliance has better success on the ground, where their sheer numbers and artificial constructs capture several strategic positions. As the Thran Alliance prepares for a march through the desert to attack Halcyon, Yogmoth and his Phyrexians strike at the Null Sphere Station. This massive orb had been used by the Thran as a communications array to broadcast and monitor artifacts across the Empire. Yogmoth intends to launch it into the sky and use it to override the Alliance's artifact creatures, which will surely turn the tide of battle. Yogmoth also secretly prepares devastating Power Stone weapons in Phyrexia's forges, known as Stone Chargers. These massive Power Stone field bombs release blasts of pure mana and consume everything within several kilometers, reducing them to nothing. He plans to drop several Stone Chargers on the advancing Alliance troops and use the Null Sphere to absorb the mana shockwave, preventing it from leveling Halcyon. The second phase of the war unfolds in the climactic battle of Mageddon Defile. The narrow gorge acts as one of the few land routes by which to reach Halcyon, and the ambush Yogmoth has set deftly illustrates his cunning stratagems. He's placed traps and artificial constructs beneath the sands that shred through countless unsuspecting soldiers as a Thran alliance marches through Mageddon. Yogmoth uses the shock to launch a surprise strike from all sides while the alliance is set on the back foot. He deploys the first generations of Phyrexianized Thran, creatures that can no longer be called human, to the front lines where they tear through line after line of Thran soldiers. Their genetic modifications make them stronger, more brutal, and more fearless than any threat the Alliance soldiers have ever seen. But the Thran counterstrike by deploying their own Mantis engines and other artifact creatures of Glacian's design to stymie the Phyrexians. Though it seems the forces have evened, Yogmoth planned for the Thran's reliance on artifacts and power stones. 
The Null Sphere orbits high above Mageddon Defile, and at Yagmoth's signal, it activates to take total control over the artifact creatures within his foe's ranks. Metal and flesh connect. Bones crack and gears grind as Phyrexians, Constructs, and Thran soldiers come together in battle. The activation of the Null Sphere results in a crushing defeat for the Alliance, but Yagmoth's victory is short-lived when he realizes that two more Alliance armies twice the size of the first are mustering just beyond the horizon. He withdraws to Halcyon and prepares its defenses for battle. The last phase of the Thran-Phyrexian War and the Siege of Halcyon unfolds as Yagmoth takes to the skies with an armada of skyships and war caravals to clear out the remaining Thran Air Force. After, he intends to drop more Stone Charger bombs from the orbiting Null Sphere, which if detonated will envelop the entire Thran Alliance in a blast of pure mana and scour them from existence. Not even their memory will remain. Fighting in the sun-baked desert surrounding Halcyon grows fierce and chaotic as Thran push back the Halcyte Guard, only to be decimated by relieving Phyrexian forces. Bedlam consumes the skies above as Phyrexian warships engage the battered Thran fleet, sending searing volleys of ray cannon blasts into Thran vessels. Soon, however, the Alliance forces make marked progress on the ground and force dwindling Halcyte forces into retreat before breaking through the walls and engaging Phyrexian Halcytes in the city streets. While Carnage consumes the world above, Rebix brought to Phyrexia through the Caves of the Damned, where she sees what Yagmoth has truly become. For so long, she'd been charmed by his presence and manipulated by his words. Realization now dawns on Rebic as to how terribly dangerous he and Phyrexia are. She sees the gruesome transformations the afflicted are undergoing, and the forces mustering beneath the Agma's command. She also discovers the fates of both Dyfed and her beloved Glacian. To gain power and spread his vision across the multiverse, Yagmoth longed for a planeswalker spark, and so attacks Dyfed and scrambles her mind with a power stone dagger. This prevents her from planeswalking away and allows his priests to experiment on her in search of the planeswalking organ. Glacian, meanwhile, had been progressively deteriorating despite all of Yagmoth's efforts to heal him. Rebic learns that convalescence never occurred because Yagmoth had secretly implanted two halves of a power stone within Glacian's body. This slowly progressed his thytic condition. These halves acted as the anchor for the planar portal connecting Dominaria to Phyrexia. Disgusted in Yagmoth, but more so in herself for falling under his spell, Rebic retrieves the power stone shards from her husband's body, intent on sealing the gate to Phyrexia. It's at this moment that Yagmoth unleashes his stone charger payload onto the unsuspecting Thran armies, intending to protect Halcyon from the blast by channeling the mana into the Null Sphere. In an instant, the desert explodes in a cloud of serene destruction, and thousands perish. Yagmoth believes victory for Phyrexia is at hand, but the stone charger's blast advances towards Halcyon unabated. In a final desperate effort to defeat Yagmoth, artificers aboard the Null Sphere send the station skyward and launch it into orbit around Dominaria. Its final resting place is too far from the detonation zone to absorb mana from the stone charger blast, and Halcyon is left undefended. Cheers of victory quickly turn to shouts of panic as victorious Halcyte and Phyrexian forces realize they'll be obliterated in mere minutes. Adrenaline seizes all as every last soul makes a mad scramble for safety. Thran run alongside Phyrexians. Bitter enemies throw down weapons as each tries to save their own life. The masses surge through the tunnels beneath the city as water sluices through a pipe, until they reach the Caves of the Damned and the Gate to Phyrexia. Yagmoth seizes the opportunity to gather more followers, more specimens, more test subjects, and so invites all to walk through the gates. Where once they were separate nations and races, friend or foe, they will all be joined as one Phyrexian people in Yagmoth's beautiful paradise. Seeing no alternative, all fall for Yagmoth's false promise and pledge fealty to the Lord of Phyrexia. In short order, the majority are implanted with heartstones, sent to the vats for experimentations in Phyresis and Vivisection, and transformed into loyal, unthinking Phyrexian pawns. A few realize Phyrexia is not paradise but damnation, and attempt to flee, only to be slaughtered by Halcyte and Phyrexian guards. Standing at the junction of an impossible fork, Rebic can either face the clean and peaceful oblivion of the Stone Charger Blast, or cling on to the hope of life and join Yogmoth in his hellish Phyrexia. With Glacian's essence pleading in her mind to close the portal and Yagmoth's seductive whispers urging her to come to paradise, Rebic ultimately sets the joined Power Stone shards on the pedestal, 
sealing the gate to Phyrexia and barring Yogmoth entry into Dominaria. We can see this tragic fall from grace, this destruction and desolation of the Thran Empire in the art of the saga, Fall of the Thran, which depicts the Null Sphere high above Halcyon, Phyrexians attacking from the depths, and at its center, Rabbik's decision to close the gates to Phyrexia. Though he retains planeswalker-like powers in his artificial world, they only extend that far. Yagmas forever severed from Dominaria and from the greater multiverse. He's incapable of bridging the space between planes and spreading his vision of a perfected Phyrexia. He and his paradise are left to languish in isolation. Yagmas' obsession consumes him for the next several thousand years as he seeks not only continued Phyresis, but also an opportunity to regain access to his home plane and complete his goal of Dominarian conquest. An opportunity that arises shortly after the birth of Urza and Mishra in Zero AR. As young men, Urza and Mishra are sent to study under the archaeologist and artificer Tokasia in Teresier's desert dig sites surrounding the caves of Koilos. Here, they uncover ruins of the now ancient but technologically spectacular Thran civilization, arrangements of skeletal and metallic remains whose truth they can only begin to guess. The brothers excel in their studies and use Thran schematics to rediscover artificially powered flight through the creation of the Ornithopter, which they use to survey dig sites from the skies. Urza and Mishra realize that the ruins and scrap heaps form a pattern around the caves of Koilos, and that this location must have been of special significance to the Thran. What they don't understand is that 5,000 years ago Koilos went by another name, the Caves of the Damned, where Thytix, Phyrexians, and the implacable Yagmoth burst from the earth to bring ruin to Halcyon. The brothers and Tokasia enter the caves and find the antechamber which holds the gate to Phyrexia and in its center the pedestal where Dyfed's and Glacian's power stone sits locked. Urza and Mishra are instantly enthralled by the power stone upon entering the room. It seems to call out to each, to whisper in their minds a demand to be taken. The brothers reach for the stone simultaneously, and their touch brings about an explosion of energy. In a flash, the two are knocked to the ground. When they come to, Urza and Mishra each hold within their hands one half of the power stone. These become known as the Might Stone and Weak Stone, which we can see illustrated in the cards of the same name. Their flavor text illustrates the discovery and read, While exploring the sacred cave of Koilos with his brother Mishra and their master Tokasia, Urza fell behind in the Hall of Taxon, where he discovered the remarkable Might Stone. And, during the brother's childhood, Tokasia took them to explore the sacred cave of Koilos. There, in the Hall of Taxon, Mishra discovered the mysterious Weak Stone. Unbeknownst to the brothers, this power stone had for millennia acted as a key that bound the gate to Phyrexia and prevented Yagma's file hand from reaching Dominaria. With the seal broken, Phyrexia can once again send its atrocities, perfected through 5,000 years of Phyresis, across the blind eternities to enact their dark god's will. Yagmoth senses the gate's opening and so sends his most loyal and ruthless subordinate, Gix, to survey the landscape, assess potential opposition, and prepare a vanguard of Phyrexians as an initial invasion force. Gix had once been a man, but now he's been transformed beyond recognition into the most powerful of Yogmoth's demons. His scouting reveals a continent that's primitive and superstitious, weaknesses Yogmoth intends to exploit, and kingdoms that couldn't hope to stand against Phyrexia. The greatest threat to invasion isn't an army or a nation, but the two young artificer geniuses that discovered the secrets of Koilos. Urza and Mishra pose an obstacle, for their minds have the potential to understand and harness Thran technology and thwart the Phyrexians. If eliminated, all of Dominaria would be swept under relentless Phyrexian assault. Gix is sent to corrupt malleable minds and create a cult of worshippers loyal to Yagmoth. He quickly forms the Brotherhood of Gix, whose priests and agents infiltrate all levels of government instigate upheaval, and most importantly foment discord between Urza and Mishra, who at this point are already estranged. We see a member of the Brotherhood illustrated in the card Priest of Yagmoth. Gix's actions and the jealousy Urza and Mishra bear for another soon erupts in an all-out conflict known as the Brothers' War which consumes Terrasier and renders much of the landscape desolate. Men fight another, artificial constructs born of the Brothers' genius rip at metallic gears, and even Phyrexian war machines known as Dragon Engines are deployed, as the Brothers' War rages for decades. Though Gix's agents infiltrate both warring parties, 
Mishra's mind and quest for power are more easily manipulated. By the later stages of the Brothers' War, Mishra's advisors and closest confidants are soon replaced by Yagmoth's priests that whisper corruption in his ears. Eventually, Mishra himself is given over to Phyrexia for completion, and the man becomes a twisted amalgamation of flesh, his soul forfeit. The Brothers' War reaches its final stages on the remote island of Argoth in 64 AR, as both factions prepare themselves for a final conflict. For Yagmoth, everything unfolds according to plan. He sends Gix and a contingent of Phyrexian warriors to Argoth, which we can see in the art of the card Tainted Aether. They're meant to wait in the wings until each army depletes itself, until each brother kills another, and then they are to sweep over the field like vultures, plucking at any lingering resistance, then crush the continent of Tercier and prepare it for Yagmoth's return. Gix and his Phyrexians descend on the beleaguered armies, slaughtering man and machine alike, but the Phyrexian demon, not even Yagmoth himself, could have foreseen what transpires next. Urza finds his brother Mishra on the battlefield, and realization washes over him as he looks upon his brother, as he smells a putrid oil seep from Mishra. This is no longer Mishra, but a twisted abomination, a vision of Yagmoth's phyresis. We see this in the art and flavor text of Retaliation which reads, a foul metallic stench clogged Urza's senses. It was then he knew his brother was no more. Urza is consumed by grief, anger, and guilt, which he pours into the Golgothian Silex, an artifact of unknown origin with the power to unleash untold destruction. Urza fills the Silex with mana, supercharged by the presence of both the Might and Weak Stones. In a moment that will have repercussions for millennia, Urza unleashes the devastating Silex Blast, which sweeps over Argoth and obliterates both armies, destroys the island, plunges Dominaria into a brutal ice age, and ignites Urza's spark elevating him to the status of Planeswalker. Gix and a handful of loyal subordinates flee in time, retreating to the caves of Koilos and from there making their way to Phyrexia. Yagmoth's enraged by his lieutenant's failure and consigns Gix to everlasting torment within the burning hell of Phyrexia's seventh sphere. Perhaps the greatest consequence of Urza's Silex Blast comes with the formation of the Shard of Twelve Worlds. This metaphysical boundary surrounds Dominaria and 11 other planes within an enclosed bubble that's impermeable to travel through the blind eternities. The Shard once more locks Yagmoth out of Dominaria, the glistening jewel of his ambition just beyond his reach. For the next 4,000 years, Urza Planeswalker acts as Yagmoth's greatest adversary and the only being standing in the god's path of conquering Dominaria. Urza's hatred towards Phyrexia runs deep for what they had done to Mishra, and the Planeswalker finds an opportunity for vengeance after chancing upon the rogue Newt and sleeper agent Zancha. Urza saves Zancha's life, and in exchange she tells him how to reach Phyrexia. In short order, the genius artificer crafts a massive dragon engine with which to assault the artificial plane, then single-handedly strikes back at Yagmoth. In his rage, Urza and the dragon engine incinerate countless Phyrexians, vaporize glistening oil, and leave a terrible path of rancid destruction. We see this unfold in the card Ill-Gotten Gains, in which Urza strikes Phyrexians in the background, while Zancha escapes with her heartstone. The flavor text reads, Urza thought it a crusade. Zancha knew it was a robbery. Though Urza's powers as a planeswalker are great, Yagmoth's are greater, and his minions innumerable. Urza's strike reaches the fourth sphere of Phyrexia, but here, the Dark God infiltrates the planeswalker's mind and shatters his sanity. Urza's very soul is struck with Yagmoth's corrupting touch, which we can see unfold in the illustration and flavor text of the card Corrupt. It shows Yagmoth's black mana tendrils snaking around Urza and reads, Yagmoth brushed Urza's mind, and Urza's world convulsed. Urza's strike against Phyrexia amounts to little, but instead gives Yagmoth a focus, an outlet in which to send all of his ambition, anger, and creativity. Phyrexia's god declares a personal vendetta against the man who dare stand against perfection, and mobilizes all of Phyrexia's might in pursuit of Urza's punishment. For thousands of years, Yagmoth chases Urza across the blind eternities, granting him little respite and always learning from the Planeswalker. Each conflict with Urza grants Yagmoth knowledge on how to breed negators and agents to be more powerful than before. Though Dominaria remains safe, Urza leads Yagmoth to Sarah's realm where the Phyrexians begin a crusade of corruption and conquest, which eventually leads to the plane's demise. Yagmoth relinquishes his pursuit of Urza in 2934 AR, when the casting of the world spell 
shatters the shard of twelve worlds, and once again places Dominaria in a precariously vulnerable position. Rather than all-out invasion, Yagmoth attempts a subtle takeover by deploying waves of Phyrexian sleeper agents across the nations of Dominaria. Sleepers are Phyrexians bred to resemble humans but completely subservient to Yagmoth's will. The Dark God frees Gix from his anguish and grants the demon a chance to prove himself. Gix is given command of the Dominarian sleepers and sent to foment rebellion in the nation of Efwan Pinkar. Though initially successful in infiltrating and destabilizing, Yagmoth's plans are again thwarted by Urza as the Planeswalker neutralizes all sleepers and confronts Gix in the caves of Koilos. With Sancha's assistance, Urza destroys the demon as well as Yagmoth's hope of conquest. Infuriated by the Planeswalker's constant meddling, Yagmoth foregoes subtlety entirely and begins arranging plans for a full-scale Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria. The first step is to prepare an army of perfected Phyrexians millions strong. Yagmoth, his artificers and vat priests constantly improve their designs and genetic engineering to create hulking Phyrexian war machines, nightmarish Phyrexian negators, and terrible plague spitters. Next, Yagmoth creates a planar staging area for his army with the discovery of Flowstone and creation of Wrath. Flowstone is an incredibly malleable and resilient substance that the Phyrexians use to add mass to the artificial plane of Wrath through its harvesting beneath the stronghold. In essence, Wrath becomes a pocket plane beneath Dominaria that can hold the Phyrexian army and once its mass is equal to that of Dominaria overlay the plane and merge the two together. This would allow millions of Phyrexians to instantly disembark on Dominaria and begin a bloody invasion. It's a grand strategy for a devious mind, but Yagmoth isn't the only one making preparations for invasion. Urza Planeswalker spends centuries constructing artifacts, erecting emplacements, and recruiting the most brilliant minds to shore up Dominaria's defenses. He knows Yagmoth's intentions, and Urza too begins genetic experimentation through the Bloodlines project to create an army of superhumans known as Metathran, as well as create the heir to the legacy, a perfect individual born to not just oppose Phyrexia, but understand it and harness the awesome power of Urza's greatest weapon, the legacy. To thwart his adversary and uncover Urza's designs, Yagmoth constantly sends sleeper agents and negator strike teams to Dominaria, the most notable of all being the sleeper Krik, son of Yagmoth, who disrupts Urza's experimentation with temporal manipulation on the island of Teleria and destroys the first Telerian Academy. Although ultimately defeated, Crick's attacks prevent Urza from using a temporal aperture to travel back in time and destroy Phyrexia. And again, Yagmoth's agents disrupt the Planeswalker when they uncover the nature of Urza's bloodline projects. Sleepers, negators, and even battalions of Phyrexians are sent to centers of bloodline's activity across Dominaria and instructed to reduce them to ash. The strikes against Benalia, Keld, Yavamaya, and more mark the first stages of the Phyrexian invasion in the 3800s AR. It's during this time that Yagmoth grows a reputation amongst Dominarians as a vile overlord of darkness and artifice. The Lord of the Wastes, who commands nightmarish monstrosities, terrible machines, and whose reach extends across all of Dominaria. Finally, with all his plans made, with all of his armies readied on wrath and prepared for overlay, Yagmoth's vision is realized in 4205 AR as the Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria begins. Though Yagmoth is the grand architect of the war, he orchestrates much of Phyrexia's efforts from within the Ninth Sphere and leaves his capable generals in command of the front lines. He first sends Tsabo Tavak, the redoubtable and ruthless commander, to spearhead Phyrexia's forward assault using planar portal technology. Veteran and airborne units of Phyrexians tear the very sky and burst forth from the ether, performing lightning strikes to seize strategic positions. We see this unfold in cards like Planar Portal. Tavok's mission is to take the Caves of Koilos and open the shared gate between Dominaria and Phyrexia to allow an avenue for Yagmoth to send reinforcements. The Phyrexian general is thwarted, however, by the actions of Gerard Capuchin and the crew of the Weatherlight. Though the first phase of invasion is ultimately stalled, it comes at great cost of life for Dominaria's defenders. Unsettled and decimated by Phyrexia's vanguard, the coalition of defenders is hopeless to resist Yagmoth's second phase, the Wrathy Overlay. Primordial energies spark and crackle across all of Dominaria as the artificial pocket plane of Wrath phases into existence and overlays Dominaria. At once, the entire plane is consumed with war as millions of Phyrexian soldiers and constructs materialize from nothing. 
Chaos rules and battle lines are constantly drawn or redrawn as conflict erupts on all fronts. As Phyrexian warriors crush coalition armies, Yawgmoth's plague witches spread contagions that rack unarmed populations. It seems Yawgmoth's victory will soon be at hand, the Lord of the Wastes having countered all possible defenses Dominaria could hurtle at him. But one being he could never quite predict, never quite crush or capture, was Urza, and the Planeswalker himself devised a strategy to rip out Phyrexia's heart. He called for a direct assault on Yawgmoth, and recruited eight other Planeswalkers to assume command of the Titan engines. Massive machines bristling with missiles, mana cannons, ray guns, and protected by layers of heavy armor, the Titan engines were the destructive result of Urza's genius and artifice. We can see their power on display in the art of cards like Void and Searing Rays. Each Titan engine came equipped with a soul bomb that when detonated would reduce vast swaths to slag. If all soul bombs were detonated in unison, it would completely obliterate Phyrexia and kill Yawgmoth. Unfortunately for Dominaria, the Nine Titans' assault went unfulfilled as dissension in the ranks in Urza's last second deactivation of the Master Soul Bomb left Phyrexia bent but not broken. The cards implode in False Dawn show the detonation of several soul bombs, but the chain reaction never came as Urza Planeswalker looked upon Phyrexia and saw such beauty, such untapped potential and knowledge that he couldn't hope to destroy it. The Titan Strike and Soul Bomb detonation rends Phyrexia's outer spheres and leaves Yagmoth's paradise a desolate landscape, but the god has in his possession the greatest consolation prize, Gerard Capuchin, Hero of the Weatherlight, and Urza Planeswalker. Both succumb to Phyrexia's temptation and Yagmoth's hollow promises. Urza, Phyrexia's most vehement opposition, realizes the true beauty and knowledge held within Phyrexia and can't be moved to ignite the Master Soul Bomb. He resigns himself to Yagmoth's glory, which we can see in the flavor text of the card Warped Devotion, which shows both Urza and Gerard in the god's clutches and reads, Before the glory of Yagmoth, yes, even this makes sense. Though Capuchin's betrayal of Dominaria cuts just as deep for its defenders, his motives differ from those of the Planeswalker. Gerard lost his deepest love, Hannah, to Phyrexian plague in the first days of the invasion. Ever one to seize his enemy's weaknesses, Yagmoth tempts the despondent and heartbroken Capuchin with promises of returning Hannah from the dead if he pledges himself to the god and devotes his entire existence to Yagmoth's will. So great is Gerard's anguish that he too resigns himself to Phyrexia and pledges fealty to the Lord of the Wastes. Dominaria's greatest defenders have betrayed their friends, their kin, and their world to Phyrexian abominations. Their pledges of loyalty aren't sufficient for Yagmoth, and he demands a show of their subservience. He takes Gerard and Urza to the Phyrexian arena to fight another. Only in a duel to the death can they prove their absolute loyalty. Yagmoth strips Urza of much of his Planeswalker powers and thrusts the two into the arena to cross blades and draw blood. Gerard and Urza strike at another with steel and spell, seen in cards like Soul Link and Death Grasp. The flavor text of which reads, Yagmoth's greatest joy came from watching one hero defeat another. Yagmoth's delight is further heightened when Gerard finally defeats Urza, decapitating the Planeswalker with a clean stroke and seemingly ending the life of the god's greatest opponent for several centuries. Capuchin held his end of the bargain, so Yagmoth fulfills the other. In the Arden flavor text of the card Yagmoth's Vile Offering, we see Gerard clutching Urza's severed head and approaching the Dark God in all his splendor. In the center, Hannah is brought back from death and born anew. The card reads, Centuries ago, a mad god offered a simple trade. What's most interesting about this card is that it's the only illustration depicting Yagmoth in his godlike Phyrexian form. What stood before Gerard wasn't the true Hannah, but a simulacrum. Even the all-powerful Yagmoth was incapable of returning her body and soul from beyond. Apprehensive about Capuchin's loyalty and sensing a trap, Yagmoth placed his own consciousness within the Hannah he had created, thinking it the last place Gerard might strike. Capuchin finally saw through the Dark God's lies, saw that Hannah wasn't truly returned, and realized Yagmoth holds only empty promises. Gerard strikes out in anger and impales Hannah's simulacrum, which we see in the art of the card Jilt. The flavor text reads, You're not my Hannah. Yagmoth dealt a serious blow from Gerard's attack as his consciousness retracts, and in an involuntary reaction, he flings both Gerard and Urza's head from Phyrexia. The release 
of Dominaria's greatest defenders from his clutches is a grave mistake Yagmoth will very shortly come to regret. In the final stages of the Phyrexian invasion, the Lord of the Wastes himself emerges from Phyrexia and assumes the form of a giant cloud of black mana, death and decay incarnate. For the first time in nearly 9,000 years, Yagmoth returns to his home plane and Dominaria stands on the precipice of oblivion. The Phyrexian god rolls over continents and oceans, his terrible miasma kills with a touch and resurrects the fallen as zombified abominations enslaved to his will. We see Yagmoth's death cloud form in the art of the card Toxic Deluge, in Commander Collection Black, and the flavor text reveals his capacity for destruction. It reads, I am greater than rain and nourishment. I am glistening oil and perfection. The nations of Dominaria are hopeless to defend against such a primal force of death and phyresis. Gerard and Weatherlight steer the skyship into the Null Moon in a desperate gambit to save the plane. A huge store of white mana is held within that they hope to unleash to slay the god. History repeats as the power of the Null Moon, which had once been used by the Thran to defeat Yagmoth, is again wielded by the Weatherlight with the same hope. The ship cracks the artifact open, and a massive torrent of pure white mana hurtles towards Yagmoth, which incinerates his corruption and evaporates his clouds of decay. Though grievously injured, Yagmoth survives the white mana blast, which once again proves the enormity of his power and the threat he poses to the multiverse. Yagmoth lashes out with tendrils of black mana and rends weatherlight. As the skyship falls from the sky, so too do the hopes of Dominaria sink into the Phyrexian abyss. But Urza has one final contingency plan, one last weapon that he's cultivated and perfected over centuries to end Yogmoth's terror completely, the Legacy Weapon. The Legacy is a collection of powerful artifacts and individuals that when combined can unleash the untapped and unlimited potential of Urza's genius and Dominaria's power. Chief among the Legacy objects are Urza's Power Stone Eyes, Karn Silver Golem, and Gerard Capuchin's Soul perfected through Urza's genetic bloodlines project. Yogmoth had two of these in his grasp a short time ago, but now they've all gathered aboard the careening weatherlight. Gerard rips out Urza's eyes and places them within Karn's metal carapace, which sets off a cascade of events that consume the Planeswalker and Capuchin's lives and unleash a sentient burst of pure energy. The surge of energy seeks out Yogmoth, and despite his efforts to escape to Phyrexia, pierces the cloud of miasma and strikes Yagmoth's very soul. Convulsions surge across the skies of Urborg as the Phyrexian god plummets in his death throes. In a moment, the ancient Thran healer, the ineffable, the lord of the wastes and master of Phyrexia, who for millennia plagued Dominaria like a recurring nightmare, lies dead. This is illustrated in the art and flavor text of Urborg Tomb of Yagmoth, which shows the god's grave and reads, Yagmoth's corpse is a wound in the universe. His foul blood seeps out, infecting the land with his final curse. The Phyrexians touted Yagmoth as an untouchable and immortal force, the manifestation of perfection and phyresis. With his death, their armies become despondent, throw down their weapons, and relinquish the will to live. The legacy blast saves Dominaria from succumbing to Yagmoth's grim vision. His smoldering remains, and the aftermath of invasion, will serve as a reminder for centuries of the risks of unchecked hubris and the threat posed by the ideal of phyresis. Though the Lord of the Wastes lies dead in the fetid Urborg swamplands and his artificial paradise has been reduced to oblivion, Yagmoth's vision of phyresis and perfection survive as blueprints within the glistening oil. A sliver of the corrupting oil yet remains on the hearthstone that lies within Karn's Silver Golem. Though his status as a planeswalker renders Karn immune to the Phyrexian contagion, it also allows the oil to avoid detection. For centuries, Karn travels the multiverse, unwittingly seeding countless planes with glistening oil and endangering them with the possibility of a new Phyrexia. Nowhere is this more apparent than the artificial plane of Argentum, a world of Karn's own design. The plane shares many similarities to Yagmoth's Phyrexia, and the glistening oil Karn inadvertently introduces to Argentum plants itself firmly and quickly spreads. Memnarch, the golem steward meant to guard Argentum in Karn's absence, is first to succumb to the Phyrexian contagion. It drives him mad and corrupts his purpose. Memnarch no longer protects his master's creation, 
but instead acts as overlord of an Argentum transformed into Mirrodin. Memnarch builds soul traps with which he ensnares and transports several species from multiple planes to inhabit Mirrodin in hopes of harvesting a spark. All the while, the Phyrexian oil slowly evolves within Mirrodin's core and corrupts the heart of the plane, seen in the card Phyrexia's core. Here, the first creatures of twisted metal and rotting flesh arise as a new Phyrexia to bear Yogmoth's torch and raise a new father or mother of machines. New Phyrexia grows in secret and spreads its corruption across the world above, seen in cards like Steady Progress, Spread the Sickness, and Icker Wellspring. Eventually, Phyrexia wages war against the Mirans and claims Mirrodin as New Phyrexia, where the five ruling praetors carry out Yagmoth's will and spread the blessing of perfection. New Phyrexia and the nature of Phyrexians is a topic we'll discuss at length in a future video. But New Phyrexia isn't the only place in the multiverse where Yagmoth's legacy can be found. The recent Streets of New Capenna set reveals that Phyrexians exist beyond the City of Vice's protective barriers. This strain of Phyrexians proved powerful enough to destroy the kingdoms of old and nearly consume the entire plane in a relentless advance of Phyresis. Though they were eventually defeated by Capenna's angelic and demonic hosts, some Phyrexians are presumed to remain in the wastes beyond New Capenna, hunting nomad caravans and experimenting on captured prisoners. And the events that unfold in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty see one of Yagma's greatest ambitions realized the collection and Phyrexianization of a Planeswalker Spark. For millennia, Yagmoth sought a way to escape beyond the confines of his paradise and spread the gift of Phyresis across the blind eternities. He had experimented on Dyfed in search of the Planeswalking organ. He tested planar portal technology, but he had never himself harnessed the power of a spark for Phyrexia. With Tamiyo the Moon Sage's completion, Phyrexia now has a loyal servant capable of spreading Yagmoth's blessing throughout the multiverse. Yogmoth, a name that will forever haunt Dominaria and the vast multiverse beyond. No realm touched by his terrible plague will escape the Dark God and his Phyrexian abominations. Though in truth the physician was a brilliant healer and a strong leader with the potential to do much good for the masses, Yogmoth's obsession with perfection and egotistical self-indulgence pulled him from the path of righteousness and forever cast his life in shadow. He used his genius for nefarious ends and became a creature feared by all as the relentless force of death and corruption. With his own death and the destruction of Phyrexia, the multiverse breathed a sigh of relief, but the reprieve was short-lived. On the metallic plane of Mirrodin, a new Phyrexia is on the rise, dominated by the machine orthodoxy and slowly probing other worlds as it prepares to extend itself beyond the blind eternities. Who will come forth to claim the position vacated by Yagmoth? Who will become the new father or mother of machines, continue the glorious work, and pursue grisly perfection to carry out Yagmoth's legacy across the multiverse? Thank you so much for watching and listening to this video on the story of Yagmoth. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on the Thran physician. What was his most heinous act? Do you agree with his logic? What will be the fate of Phyrexia? Let me know as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, consider subscribing to the channel or checking out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. Again, a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I couldn't do it without their spectacular patronage. If you're interested in becoming a Lord Luminary for access to me, a great community, and early video drops, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash lorebrands to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.